So what is this highest level of human cognition, this thing that really uniquely humans are capable of thinking? Uh, it's really this conscious ability to manipulate our knowledge, to sort of have metacognitive awareness of the contents of what is going on in our minds and to sort of consciously, explicitly manipulate that knowledge in our minds to achieve particular kinds of goals, solve problems, and understand you know, things more deeply. Uh, it takes time, and there's this sense that it's you know, a multi-step, attention-demanding, fully conscious kind of process. It really requires kind of working through steps of ideas. So we really want to understand how the brain can support this kind of conscious cognitive thinking activity and what particular parts of the brain are particularly important for this and how we can understand, you know, how it is that we can do this probably in ways that other animals cannot. What makes our brain special that allows us to think and, and really solve problems in a flexible and adaptive way that really is key to our survival and success as a species. Here's where the computer metaphor that developed in the 1960s really has a lot of validity. Uh, there's something called the Turing machine developed by Alan Turing that really shows how a very simple kind of computational device can solve any problem okay it's a universal computational system and really it's it's extremely simple it's beguilingly simple it's just the ability to read and write information from some kind of memory system and turing envisioned this as a tape uh, that you could kind of read and write to and then some basic uh you know limited amount of memory internally that you hold on to this kind of internal state uh, information and then von Neumann took these original ideas from Turing and turned it into the modern computer architecture that we know today. And this involves a central processing unit, which contains a set of instructions that essentially do basic elements of reading and writing and conditionals, testing the contents of memory, and then doing something different depending on the current state of the system. And then you have RAM, which can hold on to kind of the working active memory, as we talked about in the memory chapter, and then uh, a secondary long-term uh, large capacity memory in this hard disk. And we talked about how the hippocampus can maybe be seen as playing this role of the hard disk. And the RAM is kind of the current active neurons firing in your brain. And so this whole system kind of interacts with that memory framework that we developed in the previous chapter to, to understand how it is that we can have these kind of active contents, these consciously accessible active neural firing in our brains that allows us to do this kind of information processing. And somehow it seems quite compelling that all of that stuff turns into and supports the ability to be sort of like a Turing machine that we can actually reason through and perform information processing in a way that is sort of analogous to a, uh, a von Neumann computer architecture. But we don't, as we said in the memory chapter, we don't have any of these kind of mechanisms literally in our brains. There's nothing like centralized about our central processing units. Uh, and we don't have a separate system called RAM uh, it's all just emerging out of these networks of neurons. And so understanding how the actual structure of the biology of the brain gives rise to something that functions sort of like this Turing machine is one of the great challenges uh, on the frontiers of current research in neuroscience. And one of the key concepts here is the notion of an algorithm. An algorithm provides a recipe essentially for writing computer programs to solve particular kinds of problems. So you're familiar with many different kinds of algorithms. For example, the algorithm you use in doing mental multiplication, you have to multiply the first uh, ones digit and then you carry the results and you write them down and all that other stuff. These are just a series of steps 
that you have to go through. And by performing each of these elemental steps, each of which is relatively simple, you end up solving a larger overall problem. And so that is really the essence of how computers work. And it corresponds to this notion we have in thinking of this kind of step-by-step -step process evolving over time where we take these individual kind of mental steps, each of which is relatively straightforward, but when they add them, when we add them up and, and combine them in different ways, we can solve many different kinds of problems by, by organizing our mental operations in different ways. And that's really the essential insight of a Turing machine and the universal power of computers is that really simple elemental operations combined in different ways can solve any problem. And, and really it's just a question of how long it takes, how many operations, and that's why it's so easy to increase the power of computers by increasing the speed. That means you can do more of these steps, solve more complex problems more quickly. But in the brain, again, all the neurons are working in parallel. And so we have a unique combination of a parallel and serial processing system in our minds. So we think that the neural equivalent of the uh, Turing machine, this neural CPU, it's something that emerges out of all this parallel processing taking place everywhere in the brain. And it, it particularly involves the contribution of the prefrontal cortex in maintaining this kind of intermediate active working memory state that we talked about in the memory chapter, um, and probably also maintaining the current program that we're working on. And, and we think that these programs that we use to guide our uh, execution of these algorithms in our own minds is probably very closely tied to our own actual native natural language, right? We actually talk ourselves through solving different kinds of mental problems. When you do those kinds of mental arithmetic problems, you kind of tell yourself, okay, first do the ones, then do the tens, carry that thing. You know, you just kind of have your own mental instruction. And so in school, we learn through verbal instruction and we can kind of internalize those verbal instructions and use that kind of capacity of our verbal memory to store, manipulate, and, and update our kind of mental programs. And so that ability for us to turn kind of words into mental actions is a really critical element of our uh, neural CPU. And when you think about that, you can see why it's not likely that other animals who lack this kind of very elaborate form of language that we have could really achieve the same level of computation. This need for a kind of language is really critical uh, for understanding how, the, how we can be so flexible. So as I said, the, the prefrontal cortex is really important for this active memory component, this ability to maintain the current state of information in a, in a Turing machine-like system, like the RAM, uh, the cache, and the registers in the CPU, all of these things correspond to kind of the, the active contents of what you're working on as you're solving some kind of problem. And these are like the, the ones and, and tens things that you're carrying and crossing out and, and all that. That's like the current state uh, as you're going through and solving a particular problem. And then uh, we can think about the hippocampus as playing the role, as we said, about of this longer term memory system that's encoding uh, memory and enabling us to retrieve kind of a larger amount of information from our prior experiences. And that has a much higher capacity than kind of this local active working memory. And so those components really do map on uh, to uh, the key elements of a computer architecture and allow us to go beyond the, the very efficient, fast, parallel processing that our brains naturally perform to approximate and achieve this high level sequential processing.